great to be here. Um, uh, I want to welcome you all um, uh, on, on behalf of Cloudera um, to our technology day here. Um, uh, we have a lot of exciting updates we want to share with you today. Um, uh, we want to answer your questions, um, and uh, we want to we want to talk to you and hear from you and interact today. Um, uh, so so please uh, please stay tuned for for a lot of good stuff. Um, I'm as was mentioned, Doug Cutting. I'm the chief architect at Cloudera. Um, we've got a lot of uh, great speakers today, uh, and I really encourage you um, to ask questions um, and. Uh, benefit from their expertise. Um, uh, I want to ask right now all of the members of the Cloudera team to stand up who are in the room uh, so that people know who they are. Feel free to bug any of these people at pretty much any time and, uh, and hopefully they'll, they'll steer you in the right direction, all right? Um, uh, we really want to uh, communicate with you about the, the latest uh, developments in the, in the Hadoop stack um, and uh, make the best of your time here today. Um, uh, we're really happy to be in this venue, uh, the, the Mead Center for American Theater. Um, all of the morning sessions uh, will be held here in the Krieger, uh, and uh, in the afternoon um, uh, we'll be uh, splitting uh, between here, the Emmerman Rehearsal Hall, and the classroom upstairs. Um, so a couple of uh, quick announcements before we get started. Uh, we have a hashtag for the day if you're tweeting anything. It's um, hashtag gov data forum, uh, all one word. Um, uh, we're also, uh, at the end of each thing, we'll have folks come around with microphones, so when you, when you have questions, um, uh, please use the microphone so that everyone can hear them and we can also uh, record them. Uh, and we will be, as I implied, uh, recording all the sessions um, and uh, they will be available for any of your colleagues uh, who couldn't make it here today um, uh, to watch later. Um, uh, we'll also give you all the slides um, uh, later. Um, uh, we'll send you an email uh, in the, I think next month we'll get you an email with a with the, with the link to all the slides. Um, and you can also get the um, biographies of all the speakers um, uh, on the website, um, which is uh, govexec.com slash Cloudera Tech Day. You don't have to remember that. It'll, it'll be uh, easy to find. Um, uh, we've also given everybody an evaluation form, uh, I hope, um, to give us feedback on uh, how the event went for you. Um, so I encourage you uh, to, to fill that out and turn it back in um, at, the, at the front desk at registration um, uh, so we can improve this um, and make it better next year. Um, uh, if you didn't get an evaluation form, uh, you, can, you can always grab one. Um, uh, last thing I want to mention, uh, the agendas uh, are being reprinted as we speak um, and they'll be distributed uh, at the break. There was uh, some changes at the last minute in the agenda. Um, uh, so uh, please be patient and, and we'll get you a copy of those. Um, so now it's, it's my pleasure to um, give the, the first presentation. Uh, I'm just going to talk uh, briefly, um, sort of uh, uh, give, give some context. Um, uh, it's been, as you, you heard in the video, uh, 10 years uh, since um, Hadoop started uh, and uh, been, been quite a ride. Uh, but Hadoop is, is um, arrived around the same time as some, some other trends. Um, I just saw last week uh, that uh, AWS, uh, the, the, the Amazon's uh, cloud service, um, is celebrating its 10th anniversary as well. Uh, and so cloud is really about the same age as Hadoop. And I think there's a number of trends uh, that are really combining to give uh, folks in IT a, a new world, uh, a new way of building things uh, that's different at, at lots of levels. Uh, you, you know, the technologies are all obviously different. Um, uh, the, the ways we deploy these technologies are different, but I think also the style of use and the way that the technologies are controlled and developing uh, is, is changing fundamentally. And I think in all these cases, uh, changing for the better um, uh, to, to the benefit of, of those of us who, who build these systems. Um, and so I want to talk today about uh, Spark, um, uh, Spark replacing MapReduce uh, in the Hadoop stack, um, partly because it's, it's an important thing to understand but also as an example of, of the way uh, this uh, ecosystem changes now um, uh, that is uh, fundamentally different uh, than, than, I think, uh, prior generations of technology. So first, um, let's, uh, let's go back uh, to the, the beginnings. Um, in, in Hadoop, originally, uh, there, were, there were really two components. Uh, 
back there in, in 2006 that we started with a distributed file system, HDFS, and on top of that, a distributed execution engine, uh, MapReduce. Um, and that was, that was all you got. Um, it was enough um, to really get a lot of folks started. It was the, you know, the big change was that it was um, ran, running on uh, commodity hardware. Uh, it scaled linearly, so you could buy lots and lots of cheap hardware and keep running on more and more data. So it scaled further than anything you could buy um, and at a much lower base cost um, per gigabyte uh, as well. Um, uh, so, so it had some real advantages there. Um, uh, the, the only programming uh, methodology available uh, was, was MapReduce. Um, and MapReduce had, had a lot of um, uh, advantages you know, that, that really made it work here. Um, uh, among them was, was the, the notion that you move the computation to the data, so you could store the data uh, in a distributed manner uh, on these and then split the computation up uh, and, and, and uh, move it to the location of the data. Um, but also the, the, the built-in uh, fault tolerance was, was really key. Um, if you want to scale, uh, you need to have automated fault tolerance. This is the, was the key to HDFS and was the key to MapReduce, um, uh, was building that in from the outset. Gives you this ability to use um, lots of inexpensive hardware. Um, uh, and and is in fact, was, was the hard part about implementing these. Uh, both HDFS and MapReduce uh, running on a single machine would be you know, a few pages of code. Um, uh, it's only when, they, when, when you want them to run in a distributed, reliable manner uh, that, it, that it starts to get complicated. Um, uh, so I've already talked a little bit about uh, linear scalability. So that, that was, you know, that, that's obviously a very big deal, that you could uh, run on 10 nodes, and if, uh, if you had more data or you needed to process things more quickly, you could add, go to 20 or 100 or 1,000. Um, uh, and this was, was very different um, uh, than most technologies which, which, uh, of, of the day, which tapped out at some point. Um, and, uh, and, and wouldn't, wouldn't scale past a certain level very, very easily. Um, but, you know, it, it, MapReduce isn't perfect. Uh, nothing and few of us are. Um, uh, and, and through the years, uh, something's come along which is significantly better on, on just about every measure than MapReduce. Uh, in, in particular, it's got a much better API. MapReduce's API uh, forces everyone to think in terms of these map and reduce functions, which are fairly straightforward, but they're also kind of low level, uh, and it, it takes uh, some time to tra translate your, your ideas into those. Um, Spark has a, has a higher level, um, richer API um, uh, with a lot more primitives, um, and primitives that are, that are easier for folks um, to build applications against. Um, it also has APIs not just in Java, like MapReduce, um, but in Scala and Python as well. Uh, and so we're really seeing it um, catch on in, in, for that reason, uh, just because folks can more easily write uh, applications. Um, it also has an interactive shell. Um, uh, you, you, can, you can develop something uh, more quickly that way. You don't have to always bundle things into a job and submit it and run it and wait for results. Um, uh, so there's a, a faster uh, development loop. Um, uh, and, and in general, we, you know, combine all these, we, we see um, you know, usually uh, less than, than half the code, uh, sometimes five, uh, one, one fifth the amount of code um, required uh, to code something equivalently uh, using Spark's APIs from, from MapReduce. Um, but moreover, uh, it's a lot faster. Um, uh, uh, MapReduce, when you're, when you're writing something with, with the multiple stages, uh, forces you to, to serialize all the data um, between each step um, to, to materialize it and, and write it to, um, uh, to HFS, to storage, um, uh, persistently. Uh, whereas uh, Spark uh, can keep intermediate data structures in memory. Uh, and uh, so if you're doing something iterative, uh, it can be 10 or 100 times faster uh, for, for some algorithms. Um, and also just in general, it's, uh, it's doing more optimizations. It has a, a little higher level view of what you're doing um, and is able to, uh, to, to parallelize more things uh, and, just, and just generally um, uh, process things faster. So all around um, uh, a win. Um, it even has um, other functionality, which isn't, isn't mentioned in this slide, uh, in streaming, uh, which has been tremendously popular. Um, uh, Spark Streaming uh, lets you process data as it's arriving uh, and, and give you, uh, you know, near real-time um, uh, interactions with your, with your data and, and, response and, and results of, of computations. Um, so you know, it's, it's taken off in a big way. The, the Spark uh, Open Source Project is one of the most popular open source projects of all time. Um, uh, developers 
are loving it. Um, uh, they're, they're adopting it in a big way. There's some uh, results from a, a recent survey um, of Spark developers um, uh, showing you know, that they're, they're, they, they, they love using it. Um, and they're, they're, they're at, picking up more and more use. They use it a lot on, on uh, Clutter CDH, um, uh, more than any other platform. Um, uh, and so we're really, really seeing this as the, the next wave. But it's important to remember how it, how it fits in um, to the larger picture. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's some, some folks are like, well, Spark is replacing Hadoop. Um, and I don't, we, we don't see that as being the case. Um, Spark does a lot, it replaces, um, for the most part, MapReduce. There's still a couple of things that MapReduce can do better. Um, hopefully those will, those will disappear uh, and, and MapReduce will become legacy. But there's also a lot more things that people want to do um, besides just batch computations or streaming computations. Um, if, you, if you look at this diagram of the, of the overall platform, um, you know, batch and, and streaming are, are important components, um, but uh, Spark is not the best SQL engine for, for interactive searches. Impala is, is much better. It's purpose-built for that. Um, and it will always be a better solution for that. And that's a very um, important uh, functionality. It's a very valuable thing for folks to have. Um, uh, Spark also doesn't implement uh, you know, full-text search um, effectively. Uh, for that, we, we have Solar, um, uh, which, which is a you know, wonderful tool. It actually uh, builds on uh, what the, the first open source project you ever worked on, Lucene. Uh, and uh, in moreover, there's other SDKs um, that oftentimes make, you, uh, make sense to use instead of Spark. Um, we've got the Kite SDK. Um, and there, as you can see, there's also a lot of other components that um, uh, Spark builds on. Uh, we've got, we've got you know, the re resource management um, uh, in Yarn, um, all of the, the security features in projects like uh, Sentry and Record Service, um, uh, and then the storage layers um, uh, as, as well. Um, uh, HFS, Kudu, which you'll hear about next, um, uh, HBase. Um, so we're, we're really um, seeing this rich platform develop. This is, a, this is a, quite a contrast from that first diagram with, with, with just um, uh, MapReduce and HTFS. Um, uh, we, we've now got a lot more functionality um, uh, with, with Spark as a, as a, as a core component, um, but also sharing that with a lot of other things. And I think this is, speaks to the, the larger trend um, uh, if, if we look over time at the, the, the primary open, sources, open source platforms, open source projects um, uh, that people are using, um, uh, it's growing uh, steadily. And I don't know whether you want to call that linear growth or exponential growth or whatever. It's, it's clearly growth. Uh, and, and it's not slowing, and I don't expect it to slow. Um, uh, we, we really are in a new world. Uh, this, this is very different uh, than, than past generations. You know, if you, if you looked at the the rate of change of um, uh, data technologies in the 80s, 90s, and, and even aughts, um, uh, it was not this, this dramatic. There were, we weren't getting fundamental new tools all the time. Uh, and I think that's a, a result of a, of a change to the structure uh, of this uh, software ecosystem. Instead of having primarily our, our platform delivered to us by a few vendors who, who write it, um, we've rather got a, a, a world where uh, different groups um, can uh, propose new components, can, can, can eventually, it's, it's, it's sort of like a random mutations. Um, uh, you know, Spark, for example, came out of UC Berkeley. Um, Kafka uh, came out of uh, LinkedIn. Uh, and these things then are voted on by users. Um, people, people decide um, which are actually the most useful um, and when enough users um, uh, really demand uh, support for them, then the vendors support them. So the vendor support, in many cases, uh, comes later. Um, and it's the users uh, that are choosing these, and in some cases, the users that are writing them and building them. Um, so it's a very different evolutionary model, and we can see it's leading to much more rapid evolution, uh, giving you a lot more powerful tools um, uh, much more quickly. So I, I think you can look forward um, to improve functionality uh, for decades to come. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very exciting uh, prospect. Um, you know, it's not the only area we're going we're gonna to see change in. Um, uh, we're, we're seeing, um, uh, you know, Cloudera may finally uh, live up to its name uh, in, that, in that, you know, the cloud deployment um, is, uh, is becoming uh, a very important uh, part of this. Uh, initially, we saw very few people 
uh, deploying um, Hadoop in the cloud, uh, but over the years, more and more so. Uh, and we expect this to become as or more popular uh, than deploying it on-premises. Um, uh, and so that's, that's something I think to, to watch closely, uh, think about for, for your organization um, when it's appropriate um, uh, to, to run in the cloud because it's becoming easier and easier to do so. Um, uh, also, we're very excited about some of the hardware advances uh, that, that our partner Intel is making and, and also others. Um, uh, we're going to see a lot more memory uh, on uh, machines. I don't know how many of you were here yesterday. Mike Olson talked a little about this, um, uh, that you know, processors, um, uh, and may, we may see twice as many cores, and they may be somewhat faster, and we may see twice as many drives um, uh, per, per node, and, and they may be a little bigger. But we're going to see easily 10x the amount of memory uh, and in, in the next uh, couple of years um, uh, per node. Uh, and that's going to that's gonna change things in a, lo a lot of different ways. Um, th this whole stack has been uh, defi defined around um, certain um, uh, constants of the relationships between uh, CPUs and, and memory and, and drives. Uh, and when that, when that relationship changes, um, what you can do and how you do it um, is also going to change a lot. And so the, the technologies will change. Um, the applications you can build will change. Um, uh, we're, we're very excited um, about that. Um, and, and lastly, you know, just there, there, this larger trend, um, you know, IoT is, uh, is sort of maybe the poster child for this, um, but I, I think of it as more the, the, the digital transformation of, of our businesses. Um, uh, the, the number of uh, industries uh, that, are, that are digital now is, is, uh, is amazing. At the, at digital at their hearts, um, uh, not just using it for, you know, not just using uh, online systems for payroll, but really to um, analyze, understand, and develop um, uh, their, their core businesses. I mean, I've, I've talked with folks at companies like Caterpillar, who I never would have imagined as a, as a data company, but Caterpillar's you know, machines are now uh, encrusted with sensors that are constantly in real time streaming back um, data uh, about how those are being used, um, uh, doing predictive maintenance, understanding um, which features are used, which aren't, and they're using that to improve their products, improve their customers' experience uh, constantly. Um, and it's, it's central uh, to their you know, maintained uh, leadership in, in their industry. And we see this in industry after industry, banking, telecom, uh, and, uh, and so on, um, uh, retail, uh, and, and government. Um, I, think, I think we can continue to improve um, uh, how well we, we, we serve um, uh, by adopting more and more technology. We're, we're seeing this uh, everywhere. Uh, and it's a, it's a very exciting trend, and I think it's, Fundamentally, that's what's fueling these technological changes, is the demand, is the utility um, uh, of these, these uh, platforms. That's, that's why we have cloud. That's why we have uh, this, this big data ecosystem. Um, so I think we have a few minutes um, before our next speaker where, where I can take some questions. Um, uh, we've got a, a microphone down here. Um, anybody wants to ask me about anything I mentioned here or uh, anything else within reason? One of the drivers of Spark, of course, is Scala, and what it did to the Frazzle uh, Java uh, types. And I'm wondering how much effort are you putting into um, not really Scalizing, but uh, taking advantage of some of those new structures that are obviously advantages in Spark. Um, one example would be, you know, we're all very happy with the JVM. That's what everything runs on, but there are lots of deficiencies as well. So are you, is there thinking of LLVM in some of those directions uh, underneath uh, what we're doing for big data, that kind of? We're certainly using LLVM uh, in a lot of other areas, uh, in uh, Impala and in Kudu, which you're gonna hear about soon. Um, uh, and I, as for um, uh, you know, embracing Scala more across the platform, um, I, don't, I don't see that as a, as, a, as a primary goal. I think we're gonna, you know, within Spark, uh, continue to try to improve things there, um, but we've got a lot of other, uh, a lot of developers who aren't uh, Scala folks. You know, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of huge um, influx from the data science community of Python developers. Um, so we're spending a lot of time trying to improve the experience um, for folks using Python, um, and uh, you know, a lot of demand uh, for C and C++ still. Um, so it, it's kind of, uh, 
Yes, uh, and, <laughs> if you will. Sir. Anything else? I have a couple of questions. Um, where is Cloud Era on uh, using Hive on Spark? Um, we're investing uh, heavily in Hive on Spark um, uh, and trying to replace uh, MapReduce as the runtime for Hive uh, with Spark. Um, uh, we think that'll, that'll provide a lot of improvements uh, for Hive. We, we still don't think Hive will get to the point where it has the, the same interactive performance uh, as, as Impala. Um, but there's a lot of use cases um, where that's not what you need, where you need effectively batch SQL. Um, uh, we're also um, uh, interested in um, uh, Spark SQL um, uh, in, in that there's a lot of cases where folks want to make SQL queries from Spark programs. Um, uh, so there's, there's, uh, I think there's room for uh, several SQL engines uh, in this ecosystem for different kinds of applications. Pardon? Is there any timeline? Right now, is there a timeline least, for? Yeah. I'm I'm sure there is, <laughs> but I'm not sure of the of okay. the details. Um, if you if you send me a note um, or ask one of the other uh, cloud errands here, uh, we we can get back to you on on what the the release timeline is um, for Hive uh, Hive on Spark. Um, okay. I think My we've got a I think we've got an evaluation version of it. You can uh, download and install today, um, uh, and but I don't know exactly when it's going to be uh, a supported uh, part of the of a release. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. My second question would be uh, on the Spark context. Um, is there any um, uh, built-in feature uh, where we can uh, share Spark context from remote uh, web cluster? I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer that. You're going to have to find somebody who's more of a, a Spark expert in, on, in the Spark roadmap. Um, so uh, it's more on lines like uh, yeah. um, we have a Spark job server. So would you be incorporating uh, those features related to Spark job server into CDH anytime soon? I, I don't know the, the timeline for that. Again, okay. uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't keep track of all the, the product timelines, unfortunately. Okay. If, I, I don't have the memory for that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So along the lines of what he just said with the sharing some of the Spark um, stuff, I noticed you guys have a notebook. It's not yet out there. Um, we're looking at Jupyter as one of them, but the other one I saw was the Libby server. Is there any timeline to get that integrated into um, Hue in terms of the curry editor and stuff like that built into the latest CDH parcels or anything like that? Because I, you know, I'm an admin, so I, you know, played around with it a little bit. Deployed it on our server, you know, had it running, built in uh, init.d script to get it started and stop. But it'll be nice to have it integrated within the parcels at some later date, you know, just to get that working properly, as well as some of the other um, libs and kernels out there for other, like you said, C, C, or, you know, PySpark or Java or whatever else integrated that notebook. So, you know, I, I should have studied the, the product timeline more this morning before I got up here. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm getting, getting a lot of good questions. Is there anybody from Cloud Air in the room who, who is on top of the product timeline uh, who can, can answer any of these? Um, I can answer some of them. Please, so please. Uh, Hive on Spark is targeted for 5.7, assuming which new is, quality goals, which is, so 5.6 is seven? a private um, release at the moment for a handful of customers with a. So that's this summer, 5.7? Um, so 5.7 should be in about three months. So three months. Yeah, okay. yeah, early, early summer. Okay. I always. Uh, Try to pad it by a month or two. You know, engineering is not always. How about the notebook? Yeah. And Spark Notebook, I understand, is sometime before C6. It, they're working on it. Um, I was at the C6 planning meeting, and so, so it depends on quality issues. Sorry? Late 2016, you'd say for the notebook? Uh, yeah, it could be earlier. Depend. It's all a quality issue at the moment. So all these things are things we're working on. We don't want to ship them full of bugs, and so. Um, for those of you who are software engineers, you know it's sometimes very hard to predict exactly when you'll shake um, enough bugs out to. Thanks. Thank you. GA. Saving me. <laughs> we, have one more. we have one more. Hey, Doug. Uh, yeah. Long time Hadoop user, so thank you very much for the last 10 years. Uh, 
sort of more in your ballpark, but maybe regarding HDFS and going to the cloud and you know cloud era entering the cloud era, uh, you know the fundamental concept of HDFS has always been push computation by storage, but in the cloud, so much storage is remote. Yep. What's the plans on that? How are we going to reconcile that? Like, you know, is HDFS, Spark gets a lot of attention, but what are we doing with HDFS to make that work better in the cloud? What are the plans yeah. there? Is there some fundamental change that's, you know, potentially going to happen? No, I think it's a great example of some of the change, changes we've seen um, around, around Hadoop. I think the um, uh, locality is um, uh, less critical uh, than, than it used to be. Um, uh, you can now afford to um, uh, keep, keep, you know, you don't need, need to necessarily only be access, accessing local storage. Networking has gotten uh, relatively faster. Um, uh, also, uh, in uh, most cloud vendors over-provision their networking. Um, it's, it's hard, you know, the, the storage is remote and it's hard to make the network the bottleneck because they've, they've built uh, beefy networks um, uh, in most, most cloud implementations. Um, and uh, as uh, more and more computation uh, moves into memory, um, the, the need for um, uh, all the data to be local uh, starts to, to decrease um, uh, as memory gets cheaper. Um, uh, so in, in changes in HDFS uh, explicitly to support that, um, and we've got, you know, erasure coding is coming out, um, but that actually turns out to, um, it, it actually, it uses, um, takes advantage of this in that you do a little more non-local I.O. Um, when you're doing uh, erasure coding, um, but you're doing less overall I.O. because you're not writing replicas, uh, as many replicas, um, and so it ends up being faster in most cases um, uh, and using less space. Um, so that's a, that's a big development in HDFS, not really driven by, the, the, by cloud or the changes in hardware. Um, we're also going to start you know, doing, uh, having better support uh, for the object stores um, uh, that, are, that are native to these clouds. If you want to um, uh, bring up ephemeral clusters, um, you don't want to necessarily have to populate uh, an ephemeral HDFS. Um, you might want to process data directly out of uh, the, the S3 or, or whatever the, the, your, your cloud's object store is. And, and write the results back there and do so as, as efficiently as possible. Uh, and so um, we're working on that and improving uh, things like Impala um, uh, to do a better job um, uh, of running queries against object stores. Um, uh, so um, that, I think we're, we're changing things more at, at that level, changing the applications um, uh, to make more effective use uh, of the cloud rather than uh, changing uh, HDFS fundamentally for the cloud. Unless there's somebody I think else. We're out of time. Thank you. Hey, Doug. This is Russell from BCBS. Uh, so the data is growing day to day is a huge. And uh, what kind of security you have in this? And uh, I'm comparing with the legacy and mainframe. We have a strong data security. So I just the big challenge. With, so far we have in the big data is security. So I just want to hear from you about the security. I, I mean, security has been a huge uh, element of uh, Cloudera's engineering uh, from the beginning. We started from a, a basis of zero security <laughs> in, in the early days with Hadoop. Uh, anybody could read or write anything, um, uh, basically. Uh, and uh, we've you know, gradually uh, improved things dramatically. Um, uh, you know, at first, adding, adding um, uh, good authorization with, with Kerberos, um, uh, then uh, gradually encrypting uh, data at uh, both on the wire um, and at rest um, uh, in, in over time every tool. As, as new things show up, um, uh, you know, like uh, Spark, for example, a couple years ago, um, uh, had no security, had no capability uh, to take advantage of, of uh, ACLs and authorization and um, uh, encryption. Uh, and so we've been retrofitting security into Spark, and we're almost through with that at this point, but there's more new things. Um, uh, Kudu, which you're gonna hear about, um, uh, is at this point doesn't have a high degree of security integrated, but that will come over time. Um, uh, so, but the existing uh, mature tools um, have now been uh, really uh, enhanced to the level they are quite secure. Um, we've got uh, you know, customers in, uh, in, in finance and in healthcare and regulated industries um, that have very um, uh, serious security requirements uh, that we've been able to meet. Um, we've got uh, MasterCard uh, is using Hadoop extensively uh, with Cloudera. 
Um, we, we've been certified as uh, PCI compliant um, uh, with MasterCard. Um, and uh, so, so I think uh, for, for most of the platform, the platform that we support um, now is, is, is quite secure. Um, uh, I, think, I think you can, you can rely on that. And there's still work to be done to make it more flexible. There's, there's, um, uh, you'd like to you know, not just have ACLs, you'd like to be able to have um, uh, you know, a tag-based um, security where you can tag the data, data items. You'd like to have not just um, uh, column security, but cell level security. Um, and these things are, are working their way uh, into each component. It's a, it's a big process, project um, uh, to, to get that level. Um, encourage you to look at um, record service. Um, it's a, it's a neat, neat project uh, that we started, um, uh, which um, brings a lot of security to a lot of the stack um, uh, uh, in a nice, uh, elegant way. So that's, a, that's something we're, we're proud of. Um, I think we're out of time. Um, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, for those questions. Um, uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, uh, Todd Lipkin. Todd uh, was one of the uh, early engineers at Cloudera uh, and uh, initially um, did a lot of work on HDFS, including making it uh, both faster and more available. Uh, but he's been, for the last year, years, working on a, a new project, which he's going to tell you about now. Welcome, Todd.